program this year, fiscal year 2025 renewal training. <clears throat> My name is Karen Schechtschneider, and I am an education program consultant here at the Louisiana Department of Education with the Child and Adult Care Food Program. And I'm going to be one of your presenters today. Um, before we get started, we are going to share our non-discrimination statement. This is the uh, latest non-discrimination statement we have from USDA, which we're required to include in everything that we send out to the public. So before we actually get started, I wanted to go over some, um, some things with you to try to have our presentation run as smoothly as possible. Please make sure that you keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. We are going to try to turn you off if you accidentally turn those on, but it's very distracting when people have their cameras on or their microphones on, it disrupts the presentation. I know sometimes it can be entertaining when the cameras are on, but we need to keep all of those off because we don't even have our cameras on. We want to focus on the information that we're trying to present today. And please remember to use the chat feature to ask any questions that, um, that you may have about anything that's presented today. And please, please do not, I said do not type your name and address in the chat feature. This is no longer the way that you receive credit for attending this presentation. There is a much better way we have now of uh, obtaining your email address and sending you your, um, your credit for participating in this training. So please don't type your name and address in the chat. All it does is it crowds up the chat and it's no longer used for that. And before we move on, I wanted to give a special thanks out to Angela Lewis Kelly. She's working behind the scenes to um, on the technical issues, as most of you know, sometimes with Zoom, one of the hardest parts of doing the presentation is making sure all the technical issues work out. So thank you, Angela, for your help with that. Okay, so this is our agenda for today. And um, I'm gonna be your first presenter and I'm going to um, go over the 2025 application release information. And I'm also gonna go over any reminders about SAM, Secretary of State, IRS, or Kid Care. I'm also gonna talk to you about the online applications, um, things you need to know, reminders, and then any changes that we're going to make in the applications this year. And then I'm going to finish out just touching a little bit on procurement and vended meal contracts. Then I'm going to turn it over to Jody Corbett, and she is going to go over kid care with you. That's the new, the well, it's not new. It's actually been at least a year that um, we have that electronic system in place for CACFP record keeping. And then after um, she's finished, Brittany Augustus is going to go over some important additional information and resources with you, which includes reimbursement rates, free reduced meal applications, and the standards of eligibility. She's going to talk to you about new things coming up in the compliance review, uh, fiscal year 25, in relation to our compliance reviews. She's also going to introduce, um, or she's going to tell you about our CAC. FP staffing because we've had a lot of new staff members this year. And then Debbie Gary is going to finish out the presentation, um, giving you some information on training, and she's going to provide you with the uh, annual civil rights training that we're required to do. And then we'll have just some website resources for you. Okay, let's get started. So one of the first things everybody wants to know is since we're ending our fiscal, our current fiscal year, September 30th, and our new fiscal year starts October 1st, when are we going to get our 2025 online applications? When are we going to be able to fill those out? So we, we have been testing um, the changes that we made in the applications for this year, this week, and everything seems to be going well. So we are on schedule to release those applications the week of September 2nd, which is next week. So our office is closed on Monday for Labor Day. So anytime um, Tuesday through Friday, we'll probably be releasing applications. So you can um, expect to see your application released next week if you're able to. Um, receive it. So how will you be notified that your applications 
have been released. Once we've released them, um, the system sends an email electronically. It doesn't come from any specific reviewer. It comes from the CACFP system. It's going to tell you that the applications are available for you to be able to complete. Um, it doesn't contain, the email doesn't contain any link code or password you're going to need to access your applications. It's just letting you know that they're available. So what you would need to do is then log into the CNP website, which is the state um, website, and you will, when you go to your application section, you should automatically now find the 2025 applications. If you need to revise 2024, you'll have to select year selection and move um, back to that application. So you can, most people can expect their applications to be released next week, hopefully. So if you don't get your applications released to you next week, there's a reason. And we go over this list every year. Um, one of the main reasons we had in the past for not releasing applications is because sponsors were not um, current, their registration status under SAM was not active. So remember, you have to register with Stan SAM initially, and you have to renew that um, registration every year for it to remain active. You would do that on www.sam.gov. You need your unique entity ID number, and that can be found on page one of your sponsor application uh, in the CACFP if you're not sure where that, that number is. And just as a reminder, there's never a cost to renew your SAM registration. We still hear from sponsors that say that, that someone contacted them about uh, renewing their SAM registration. It was going to cost five or six hundred dollars. That is there's never a cost to renew your SAM registration. So you want to make sure that you're on the correct website when you're renewing your SAM registration. Um, and all of this, you if you were not if you didn't meet any of this criteria to have your applications released, you would have already received an email and that would have actually come from Tammy Bloyd directly. So she told me yesterday we had about 17 sponsors that still um, were not active in SAM and couldn't have their applications released. So make sure you check your email. And if SAM is the reason, then you want to go in and you want to update that status to active and send her that information to show that you are now active. Another reason would be the Louisiana Secretary of State's office. Um, you would need to file an annual report with them to be in good standing if you are registered under the Secretary of State's office. If we, if she's checked that website and you're not in good standing, then your application cannot be released. You need to go in. Most of the time, it's because you haven't filled completed your annual report with them. And I believe there is a cost for that report. I'm not sure if there still is. There was at one time. Also, if you are a nonprofit agency, um, you cannot have your tax exemption status revoked with IRS. And we don't have anyone right now that has that issue. I didn't mention that with Secretary of State, she said we had about seven sponsors that needed to update their Secretary of State information. Um, also, if you are required to have an audit, your agency uh, cannot appear on the legislative auditor's noncompliance list. So that may be another thing that holds up your application or your approval process. And then the new thing this year is kid care could possibly hold up your application. If you are not actively using kid care for daily record keeping and monthly electronic claim upload. And when Jody's going to go over the kid care section later, she's going to talk to you in detail about what is what does it actually mean that I'm actively using kid care? So that is actually the largest number of sponsors that cannot have their applications re released to them at this time. We have about 50 sponsors that are um, not active in kid care and have not responded to the email that Tammy sent to complete an action plan in order to have your applications released. So please pay attention to all these. Check your email to see if you received an email from Tammy Bloyd that says that you needed to correct any of these. And if you do, please do that as soon as possible so you can have your applications available. Okay, so what's the deadline to submit your 2025 applications once they've been released to you? So renewing sponsors must have the 2025 applications submitted and approved before November 30th, 2024 in order to be approved retroactive to October 1st, 2024. So if you don't want to miss out, you want to have that seamless ability to claim 
uh, you know, September and right into October, you need to have your applications submitted and approved with us by November 30th. So please don't wait until the last week in November to submit your applications because we could get overwhelmed with the last minute rush of applications and there's no guarantee that they can be reviewed and approved before the deadline. Our best practice recommendation is that your applications are submitted by the end of October 2024 to allow all of our staff time for to review and approve those applications. So please try to do those as soon as you get them so you can finish with that and have that taken care of for the new year. Okay, so like we said, when you get that email saying you received your, your applications or available, you're going to um, go to the CMP website that's listed above. You're going to click on sign in and then you're going to click on CMP web. And that is going to bring you to our uh, system login page where you're going to log in with your login and password. And once you do that, you're going to log into the system. You're going to click on the CACFP tab, and then you're going to click on the applications tab. See the menu of application options that you have. Just as a reminder, the upload feature is an optional feature under applications. It's there to allow you a way to submit if you want to send us a license, your updated child care license or adult license, or any other documents that you might need to send us and you're not sure who to email it to or who to send it to, you can always upload. You can use that upload feature. We added that a couple of years ago, and people don't use it quite as much as we thought they might, but it's just a reminder that it is there for you to use. And I also want to let you know that under the menu, the application menu, the waivers, there are no waivers this year. That was only during COVID, but they have not re removed that from the application menu. Hopefully we don't have any waivers in the future because we don't want any issues with COVID again. Okay, so the first step that you're going to complete in the application process is you're going to click on the requirements section. So your CACFP applications cannot be submitted until the requirements section has been completed. This is not new. We've had this for several years now. So when you click on requirements, you're going to see four certifications that you're going to have to complete. These are all the same ones that you had on the application last year. You've got sponsor information confirmation. You've got a CMP permanent agreement and not acknowledgement, a pre-approval training certification, and a CN data sharing agreement. So you see this example I have on that screen where it shows all four of those items and they all say incomplete. That means you have not certified those items. So we are going to click on each one individually. You're going to complete the information that's required, and then you're going to hit submit. And then once you do that, it will say that it was accepted on whatever date you, you completed that by, and it's going to have your name on there. So when you're finished with all of, all of those requirements, you should see accepted for each one of them. If you have any that say incomplete, then for some reason it didn't save your information, you're going to have to go back in and make sure that they, none of them say incomplete anymore before you move on to the next step. Okay, one thing I just want to remind you under that requirement section is about the first one you're going to certify, which is your sponsor information confirmation. That is an area that often holds up people's applications during the application renewal process. So what this is, is when you click on that, you're going to see all of your official information that we have in your agreement section about your organization. That includes your organization's official name as it's identified by the IRS, your mailing and physical address, your telephone number, email address, which is very important, your executive director, board chairman, and authorized representative. So that is all the information that's actually in your permanent agreement. So you're going to have to tell us if this information in this section is still correct or not. So if it's not correct, it's not going to affect your ability to complete the requirements and go on to complete your applications. What it does is once you submit that, it's going to send an email and it's going to come into uh, one of our to-do uh, list, just like when you submit your application or a revision, and it's going to tell us that you need to do an agreement amendment. And then Tammy Bloyd is going to send you the agreement amendment form for you to complete. 
you need to immediately respond to that email and correct that information on that sheet and send that back to her as soon as possible because until we receive your response with that corrected information that we can update in the system, your applications will not be approved. Um, and they will sit there if we have to wait too long to receive that information from you. We're going to um, send those applications back to you as being incomplete. And then you'll just have to resubmit them once you actually get that information corrected. So please, if you have to change any of this information, please respond as quickly as possible um, to Tammy. Okay, so now you're going to start on your applications. You must complete your applications in the order that they're listed. So you have to do your sponsor application first. You're going to do a facility application for each site that you have, and then you're going to do your budget application last. So please don't try to skip around and um, complete the budget application first, and then you're going to call us and tell us there's something wrong with this budget application. It's all zeros. It's because you, you have to fill out everything in order because information from your sponsor and your facility applications populates into your budget application and it creates your reimbursement for the year. It creates that budget for you. So make sure you follow um, that, that process. Okay, so the first application is your sponsor application. We um, have a few changes this year in the sponsor application, but not, not a whole lot. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is just a reminder, it's not a change. We've had this in the application probably the past two years at least, is that when you first open your application, and it's brand new, you haven't filled it out yet, you're gonna see at the top of each page a list of issues. And all of that is is that it's telling you you have not filled out the information that's required on that page yet. So it's really just to remind you when you haven't filled out everything that you needed to on each page. So you're gonna see that, but once you complete that page and you hit save or next, if you come back to that page, all of those issues should be gone. So if you complete, let's say you complete your sponsor application and then you come back into your sponsor application and oops, on page two, it says you have an issue at the top. Well, then you need to read what that issue is. It's going to tell you exactly what it is and where that question is that you did not complete. You need to go into that uh, question and fill it out. Because if you have any of those issues left at the top of the page, you're not going to be able to submit your applications. You're going to keep getting an error message saying you have not provided all the required information. And the whole purpose of this is just to make sure that you're submitting to us as complete an application as possible. Because if we get an incomplete application, we can't process that and we have to go back and forth with you or send it back to you. So this is just really a reminder to help you make sure that you complete everything that's required on each application page. And this issue page will appear in all of your applications. It's going to appear on your sponsor facility and budget applications. I just wanted to remind you about it again, just in this uh, sponsor application. I won't go over it again in the others. Okay, so the first change that we have in the sponsor application this year is just a minor change. It's going to be on page two of the sponsor application. It's going to be question 12B, and it's going to uh, affect all sponsors, whether you're a child care center, adult center, at-risk center. So what it is is that question 12B has just been changed to provide more clarity. So the way the question previously read was, is the institution now in compliance? And all this is, you can see 12A was related to civil rights. So all we did was update that question now. 12B will now say, is the institution now in compliance with all civil rights requirements? So it's still asking the same question we always did previously, but it's just giving more clarity that we're asking you, are you in compliance with all civil rights requirements? And of course, an agency that is um, applying for participation in the CACFP, we'd, we'd expect that answer to be yes, that you are in compliance with all civil rights requirements. So that's just a minor change. The next change that we have is going to also be on page two. It's going to be question 12E. It's going to affect all sponsors again. This is really um, a question we changed to provide the same reason as the previous one to provide more 
clarity. But this question, the way we had it previously, it wasn't even a question. It was, I'll, I'll be honest, I thought it was poorly worded and it confused a lot of people. It had double negatives in, in the, um, the statement. So previously, that statement said the institution is not ineligible for other publicly funding programs. And you answered, most of you as a sponsor applying for CACF participation would have answered, yes, you are not ineligible for other publicly funded programs. Well, this year we changed it to be in more in a question form and hopefully to to be easier for you to understand what it is that we're asking, but it also changes the way you're, you're expected to answer this question. So the updated question now you'll see for 12 E will say, has the institution been determined ineligible for other publicly funded programs? So it's really asking, is your institution ineligible for other publicly funded programs? Now we would expect a sponsor that's eligible for participation in the CACFP to answer no to that question. No, I'm not ineligible for other publicly funded programs. So that one might cause a little confusion at first, especially if some of you are using your application from last year and just kind of using that as you go along to see what you answered last year versus this year, because the this question is still, we're still trying to ask basically the same information. We just have it in, I think, a little better format for this year. Okay, so uh, also on the sponsor application on page seven, this time question 4D, this is only going to affect our school food authorities, which are our school systems that are participating in the CACFP. And I did find out this morning or clarify with our, um, our IT staff that this uh, is actually only going to show up on applications for school food authorities. So our child care centers, our adult centers, all of those other types of um, programs that are on the CACFP won't even see this on their, they'll still see this question, they won't see this option on their application. So your school food authorities now for question 4D, which is the question is asking, how are you maintaining your records for the management of the CACFP? School food authorities now will have the option to select NSLP forms and software. So that means for their national school lunch program, they're gonna use the, the, the forms that they use for that program, they're also gonna use for CACFP, which we already know those are approved forms and software. So you will not have to, if you're a school lunch um, program, you will not have to upload the previous exemption request and copies of the alternate forms like you did last year, because last year your only option was to select other forms and software. If you're a school food authority, you just select NSLP forms and software. That's what you're going to be using to maintain your CACFP records, and you don't have to upload anything. So um, that will only appear this way on school school food authorities. Our other programs will only still see three options, which is the state standardized forms, which is our paper forms for CACFP, kid care, and other forms and software. So as a reminder, we expect our sponsors to be selecting kid care because you, you're going to be required to be using that. Um, state standardized forms could also be checked in addition to kid care. Any other forms or software not likely to be approved, but you could check those. If you do, you would be required to upload a request for exemption and copies of all those alternate forms that you're requesting to be able to use for the program. So that should be it for the changes in our um, sponsor application. Very few that we completed in the sponsor. Most of our changes are going to be in the facility application. So once you finish your sponsor and you don't have any of those issues at the top of your page anymore, you can, or any of your pages, you're going to move on to the facility application. So under application menu, you're going to click on facility applications. If you're organization has multiple sites, you're going to have to complete a facility application for each site. So don't forget that. Okay, so the first change, which I'm excited about in the facility application is going to uh, 
be available for all of our sponsors. If you only have one site and you've only had one site forever, you're not going to see any difference. But if you are one of the sponsors that have multiple sites on your facility listing, this page is the example I'm showing on the screen, and you've asked us many times in the past, can you remove those inactive sites that we no longer use, that we don't even own that site anymore, that we don't sponsor that site? And we've had to tell you no, we didn't have the ability to do that. So this year, our IT staff found a way to, they thought the easiest way to try to clear up some of those inactive sites off of our sponsors uh, facility listing. So this is how it's gonna work. So sites that were not active in fiscal year 2024, which is the current year that we're in, will not appear on your sponsors fiscal year 2025 facility application listing. So if you had sites that were never approved for participation in this current fiscal year, when you receive your 2025 facility applications, they're no longer gonna be on that list. So they're only gonna stay active um, if the previous year, each year, if the previous year they were an active site for you. They just will fall off the next year if they were not active. So um, if you have a site that becomes unactive, you can always, and it becomes active again, you may um, start sponsoring that site again. You can always submit paperwork to us to add that site back to your facility listing. So it's not an issue if it's, um, it's removed from your site this year, but you need to add it back for some reason, it's not an issue. And also please let us know if it was an active site last year, but somehow it didn't carry over this year. And we need to correct that for you as soon as possible. So this will carry on each year that if um, the site was active, then the next year it will appear on your site listing. If it was inactive, it's gonna fall off. So um, just to remind you, if you have some, some of our daycares may have um, had a site that was approved maybe only for a month this fiscal year, and they closed that site and they moved to another site. Unfortunately, that site is still gonna show up in 2025 because it was considered active in 24. But if you're still on the program in 26, then that's, that site will then fall off your, your listing. So hopefully this removes some of that clutter that people had with uh, multiple sites and all these inactive sites. And I also want you to know that the inactive sites are not, not gonna appear on the application submission page when you go to submit your applications, which I know causes people a lot of headaches because that causes a lot of clutter. So I'm really excited about this feature and I hope this works well for everybody. Okay, so on um, the, again on the facility application on page two, this is this screen is what our child care centers, our Head Start centers, our emergency shelters, and our adult centers are going to see when they move to page two of the facility application. Now, you're only going to see. Question eight, which is your meal service information that asks you which meals and snacks that you are going to serve this year and your um, service time and your ADP. And you're only going to see the question that asks you how are your meals prepared? Are they prepared at the center, a central kitchen? Do you have a contract? That whole section in the middle of that page that was the at risk after school meal supplemental section that uh, these, these particular sponsors did not need to complete is no longer gonna appear on that page. And I think that's great because we had so many questions from people. People just weren't really sure if they needed to fill it out or not. And a lot of times you were filling it out when you didn't need to. So now you won't even see it on that page. So everything you will see is only information that you need to complete. So for our child care centers, our Head Start centers, and our emergency shelters, you're going to have question eight and question nine, as I previously said, the meal service and the meal preparation information. Our adult centers, you're going to have question eight or nine, and nine, and you're also going to see the offer versus serve question, which can be used in your program. So I hope this helps with that uncertainty about whether or not you need to complete um, information on a page because if you don't need to complete it, you're not going to see it any longer. So I'm also very excited about this change.
Okay, so if you are an at-risk after-school program, when you um, come to page two of the facility application, you are going to see everything um, that you saw previously um, on this page. You're going to see your question number eight, your meal service information. You're going to have your at-risk supplemental information that you're still going to have to fill out. You're also going to have the offer versus serve question that I have listed here, and you are going to still have the meal preparation question. So your page will still look the same as it always did. You will have to fill out all the information on that page. Okay, so this is continuing on page two and of the facility application. This again is for at-risk after-school programs, but it's gonna be if that facility application is for a school site. So if the site application you're filling out is for a school site, this is um, something that you're gonna to have to pay attention to. So our at-risk, after school programs that still have the at risk meal supplemental information. You're going to see school operating hours. That is, we moved that this year into a, um, it's still under the at risk section, but we kind of separated it from the expanded learning time where it was last year into its own section. So at risk sites that are school sites are going to have to provide the start and end time of the school day for that site. So if you're a school site, the application you're completing is for Louisiana Elementary, you're going to have to tell us what time does the school day start for Louisiana Elementary and what time does the school day end for that site. So this information must be provided regardless if the school is certifying that it operates an expanded learning time. Because we also use this, uh, we use it to determine if you're eligible for the expanded learning time, but we also use it to determine if you're, if you're not requesting that, is your meal time um, that you're requesting appropriate? Can it be approved? So if you are an at-risk after-school program, school site, please make sure you fill out this information. This is absolutely necessary information on page two. Okay, so still in the facility application, now on page three, question 14A. This is only, this change is only gonna apply to our at-risk after-school programs and our emergency shelters or homeless programs. So at-risk after-school programs and emergency shelters will be required to upload an LDH permit every program year. So we've, we've had that um, attachment where you could, you could attach your permit for the last couple of years, but this year you're not gonna be able to move forward if you're either of those types of programs from page three, unless you actually upload your, your current LDH permit um, on this page. So also the change is gonna affect any school food authorities that are operating the at-risk program. You are, are now going to have to upload your, um, your LDH permit also. We're not asking you to obtain any new permit. It's just your annual permit, just like you upload if you're participating like in the summer um, feeding program. And that is for your school sites and your non-school sites for our, our school food authorities. So you will also be required to upload that permit. So if you don't upload the permit, you're going to get that message that we're showing you at the top of the screen, and it's not going to allow you to submit your application. And I just want to remind our child care centers, Head Start centers, and adult centers, you do not have to attach your LDH permit for question 14A. It's not going to require you to do that because you have to provide us with your license, and that goes separately into our system, and that's how we uh, ensure that you're eligible for participation. So please, if you are an at-risk program or emergency shelter, please pay attention to this and have all your permits ready to be able to submit um, your applications. Okay, still on page five, on question, um, I'm sorry, still on the facility application on page five, this um, this change is going to affect all sponsors, and this, we're trying this out this year. I'm not exactly sure how well this is going to work, but um, this is going to affect question 20 on page 5, and that question was the question that would ask you to list the number currently enrolled by the racial ethnic groups. So, you know, in, in question 19, you had to list how many participants you had enrolled 
And then you had to take that number and you had to come down to, to question 20 and try to break that down into racial ethnic groups. So now you can only list um, the racial ethnic groups of the enrolled participants that can be determined by self-reported information. What does that mean? That means that if the participant did not, or their, their guardian did not indicate on any paperwork what they uh, their racial or ethnic group is, then you cannot assume that for them. So any difference that you're gonna have between the total number of enrolled participants and the number of participants by racial ethnic group is gonna be automatically calculated by the CNP system for you. And that number is gonna appear next to the number of participants with unknown racial ethnic groups. So what that means is if you've got 420 like the example shows 420 enrolled and you only know you can only have self-reported data for 375 of those participants. If you um, in, put that information under those two questions, the system's going to automatically calculate that you had 45 participants with unknown racial ethnic uh, groups. So you don't have to do the math. The system's going to do the math for you. If you know all of their racial ethnic groups because they self-reported, then by all means that number will match and the uh, number of enrolled participants and then your calculated number will be zero for unknown. If you have participants that identify as more than one race and you had 425 listed under question 20, then the system is just gonna um, zero that out and you're gonna have zero listed as unknown um, under there. So we're trying that out this year. We'll see how that works out. So all you still have to do is list your number of enrolled participants and then list your number of enrolled by racial ethnic group if you have self-reported data for those individuals. Okay, so that's it for our facility application changes. Um, now, once you um, complete your facility application, you're gonna move on to your budget application. The good news is we don't have any changes in our budget application this year for fiscal year 2025. We we do need to make some changes, but that is a lot more complicated than making some of these other changes that we have made, we're able to make in our sponsor or facility application. Okay, so we're just going to go over some reminders for your uh, budget applications, uh, because this is also another area that sometimes holds up people's applications when they're um, in the process of being approved. If we um, don't have all the correct information or if what you submitted cannot be uh, approved. So we added this in here just to remind people that sponsors should take into account the actual amount of money earned from reimbursements in prior years and not just the total estimated reimbursement when you're completing your updated annual budget. So what that means is, is that we're asking you to pay attention to what you actually earned over the last year or two in the CACFP from your reimbursements each month. You can add that up and see what, what you actually earn because the total estimated reimbursement that our system calculates and says, oh, this is how much you might earn this year. Um, if every child showed up every day, ate every meal, that's based on perfect attendance and you know that does not happen. So what that does is it kind of creates an inflated expectation of how much money you're gonna receive for the fiscal year. So we want you to be reasonable about what you're asking for in your categories because we can see that. We can see how much you actually earned um, from previous years. So I'll give you an example. We, we have some people might earn in their budget says they're gonna earn $100,000 for the year. But when we look back at last year, you you actually only earned $50,000 because not all of your kids showed up every day and ate every meal. And you know, that's how you're paid, not, not based on this amount that the budget totals. So take that into account and be reasonable with some of the, um, the things that you're requesting in your budget because you may not even be able to pay those things um, because you're not going to earn, in actuality, enough money to pay them. So always remember that at least 50% of your estimated reimbursement needs to be spent on food purchases. So when you're completing your budget, make sure that the amount you place in food purchases is at least 50%. 
Your budget also cannot exceed, your budget amount you're asking for cannot exceed the total estimated reimbursement for the fiscal year. So if your budget says you're going to earn $100,000 a max for the year, you can ask to spend $150,000. Um, and also your administrative expenses can never exceed 15% of your budget. Uh, labor costs paid with CACFP funds must reflect the time spent on CACFP duties only. If an employee has multiple duties in an agency, only the, the time spent on the assigned CACFP duties may be included in your budget and approved to be paid with CACFP funds. So please don't list someone, a teacher that does multiple jobs, but she may have some food service duties. Don't list her on there for eight hours a day. If not, all eight hours a day are spent on CACFP duties. So just pay attention to that when you're listing out your staff for labor. Budget categories that appear to be excessive or that are shared costs would require additional information to be approved. Shared costs are costs that benefit more than pro one program, such as utilities, telephone audits, et cetera. And they would require an allocation plan to support the amount that you charge to CACFP. So you can't just charge all your utilities, all your telephone calls, all your audit costs to CACFP because other pro other parts of your business do also share those costs. And this is important to remember because we get applications that have these item budget items in them a lot, and they also don't have um, contracts submitted with them or paperwork submitted with them. Um, if you have things like office, kitchen, or equipment maintenance contract in your budget, then you need to make sure the upload feature in the budget application that you have included that contract in there. Autoclore service, whether it's a contract or your monthly bill that shows us how much that service is going to cost. Grease trap service, and for some of our uh, head starts that have consultant dietitian contracts, anything that would be a contract uh, that for services would need to be um, included along with the budget application. And I'll show you on the next page just to remind you where that that belongs. Also, the state agency can require any additional information for sponsors to ensure that any particular cost is allowable. So we can ask you for additional information for anything that's included in your budget. And we can't approve your budget until we receive all the required documentation. So please make sure if you've done this many times in the past and we always ask for additional information, just provide it with the application instead of us having to come back and ask you for the information. Because if we receive it without it and we can't get that information from you in a timely manner, that's going to be considered an incomplete application, and we're going to have to return it to you until you can submit that information. Okay, this is what the budget page looks like with um, all these error messages that we were talking about. So if your total estimated reimbursement is only about $168,000, you can um, request as this sample shows $175,000. It's going to tell you that your... Um, your budget total exceeds your estimated reimbursement and it's going to prevent you from submitting your, your applications. If your food purchases are at 45%, you're going to get that error message that you see on the right that says that your food purchases are less. If your administrative expenses or like the example in there, 24%, then you're going to get an error message saying that you exceed that 15% allowance for administrative expenses. All of these things are going to prevent you from being able to submit your application for approval. So we're just trying to get you to correct any of these errors before you submit your applications. Also, there's an example you see in the lower right hand corner of if you have to attach anything with your applications, we have the upload feature right underneath the annual budget where you can attach any documents that you need to send to us to justify your budget. Okay, so once you're finished with all of your applications, this is just a reminder that if you have not cleared up any of those issues on any of those pages, you're going to see them again. They're not going to go away. They're going to show up on this submission page, and they're going to tell you you've not given the required responses to the following fields. It's going to tell you exactly, just like it does on that of the issues, it's going to tell you exactly what you didn't answer and where that information is included. You're going to have to go back and correct those those things. Also pay attention if you have facility applications with expired licenses, it's going to say that we have no record of a DSS license on file. So you have to have 
send us your out your um your license so we can update that in the system. Otherwise, you won't be able to submit that facility application. So you want to make sure all those errors are corrected for all your active sites because when you hit the submission button, you want to see what you see on the right hand side, which is a checkbox for your sponsor, your budget, and all of your facility applications that you need to submit so that you can submit that all together. Okay, so just some to remind you, you once your applications have been approved for the fiscal year, you can you can submit revisions throughout the year to your applications if anything changes. Because remember, your applications are what you're approved to do in the program. They're approved how you can spend your money. They're approved when you do your training, when you do your monitoring. They're there when you serve your meals, all of that. So that is what you're approved for. If you need to change any of that, you can submit those revisions throughout the year. But these are just some reminders of things that we had to implement. So calendar changes must be submitted as soon as possible, preferably before the changes occur. So if you have a date set change in your calendar, you need to submit them as soon as possible. They are, if they're not submitted in a timely manner, we have no guarantee of uh, granting approval before the claiming deadline. So what happens is sometimes people don't, um, they wait till they're almost at the 60 day deadline for submitting a claim. And then they go to submit the claim and they realize that their calendar is not, um, they were actually open on some of those days for that particular month. So then you have to start completing this revision. Well, when you submit applications now, when you submit revisions, we have an additional review or we have an additional step in our review process, which makes that process take longer for you to get approval. So please don't procrastinate. Do that as quickly as possible. If you are adding a site to your CACFP listing, it's recommended that the site additions be submitted before the site actually begins CACFP operations all required paperwork for the addition of a new site must be submitted prior to the facility being added to your facility listing. Submission and acceptance of paperwork is not considered approval because we have this issue also. People say, oh, I need to add a site. I'm going to send you my license in the pre-approval form. We add it to their facility listing, but they never complete the facility application that's created for that site and submit it. Well, that's a problem. You need to do that as soon as possible because that's the final step in approval. So site additions will only be approved for CACFP participation to start in the month that that facility application was submitted. So if you're adding a new site, you get your paperwork into it as soon as possible. We add that site. You need to hurry up and submit that application in the month that, you're, um, that you received it. Because if you don't, you, you might miss out on being able to claim a month that you might have been eligible to claim. So at-risk sponsors, if you're requesting to serve meals and snacks on weekends or holidays, you must, you absolutely have to submit and receive prior approval for those operating days. Weekend or holiday service will not receive a retroactive approval any longer. Budget revisions are also not retroactive. The expense must be approved by the state agency before it can be paid with CACFP funds. So if you have a review and you're paying something that you shouldn't, and you're told you need to revise your budget, you'll revise it to, and you, because you want to pay that expense and it is an allowable expense for CACFP. When you submit that revision, it's only going to be approved to start in the month that you submitted it. It's not going to go back and cover you for all that time that you were actually paying it when you weren't approved to pay it. And if you're adding a site or making any changes that affect the calendar, the operating calendar, the type of meals or snacks served, enrollment or labor costs, then you must always submit a sponsor and budget application revision along with the facility application. We have a lot of problems with this, people not submitting all of those applications together for revisions. If they're not all submitted together in a revision package, the applications have to be returned to you as an incomplete package. So please make sure that you pay attention to that. So we do have that feature now where we can return applications to you if they are incomplete. They are returned electronically. All it does is it sends it back to you and it returns to you as it's been unsubmitted. It's no longer submitted to us. You will receive an email with a list of specific information that you were lacking or the reason why we had to um, submit it back to you 
and telling you what you need to do to correct that and then resubmit your application. So some examples of why we might release the application back to you or return it to you is that you uploaded an expired LDH permit um, in your facility application if you're an at-risk or emergency homeless shelter. You have to submit a current permit. You submitted your budget and you had all these very specific budget items, but you didn't have your budget justification included with it. Um, you didn't include if sufficient documentation if you have a vended meal contract because there is a place for you to upload that in the sponsor application. Um, application packages were submitted with all, all, all your active sites because maybe one of your licenses was expired and you didn't submit everything together. Um, in revisions, again, as I just said, without all the necessary applications. So that doesn't stop you from resubmitting. We're just telling you what you were lacking and you need to fix to be able to resubmit. Okay, so that's it for the section on the applications. I'm going to briefly go over some information on procurement and vending meals um, really quickly. This actually does not apply to the majority of our sponsors, but we are getting more and more um, new sponsors or sponsors that are already on the program that are asking about vended meals or something has occurred in their agency and they have to switch from preparing their meals on site to going to vended meals. So I included just a, a definition of what a vended meal is. A vended meal provider is commonly referred to as a caterer. They provide ready to eat meals and our snacks and additional required documentation to CACFP participating sites that are not able to prepare their own CACFP meals and or snacks. So that means you're not preparing your own food. Someone's preparing all of your meals and snacks for you and selling you those meals and snacks that you're serving to your children and claiming reimbursement for. So that is not as simple as I'm going to Walmart, I'm going to Sam's, I'm purchasing all my food, and then I'm going to prepare all my meals on site. This could be a training all on its own, but I'm just going to try to give you some basics that um, the, the main thing I want you to take away here is if you're interested in any of this, if this is something that uh, and I'm not advocating for vended meal contracts at all, but if this is something that might be in your future, contact the state agency as soon as possible because it is a complicated process and we want to help you with it. So if your vended meal contract that you're going to be um, entering into with this vendor is going to be more than $60,000 for the year, you're going to have to complete what's called formal procurement procedures, and you're going to have to submit all of that to the state agency for approval before entering into that contract. And there's a whole lot that goes into it, but some of the form of procurement involves you publicly advertising in a newspaper you obtaining sealed bids from, um, from bidders and vendors or competitive proposals that you have to review and award those bids based on the lowest price. Um, that type of contract, if you um, have, have completed the formal procurement, you may be eligible to renew that contract up to four years without having to redo the formal procurement as long as any changes in the contract are not considered a material change. Um, again, any renewals for that contract would have to be approved by the state agency. If the contract for vended meals that you might be interested in is less than 60,000 a year, you can use informal methods, which means that um, you would obtain three written, obtain written quotes from at least three different vendors. Contracts obtained in this manner are not eligible for renewal the way the formal um, contracts or each year you would have to get written price quotes from at least three different vendors um, to renew to to be able to continue um, with the contract. So it's not automatic. You can just renew with the same vendor if you didn't have any changes. You have to get those written quotes each year. Uh, and as as I said previously, everything has to be approved by the state agency before you enter in those vending meal contracts. We have some links on here that go into a little more detail about procurement procedures. Um, just one more slide for our uh, sponsors also that are already on the program that have vended meal contracts. You want to make sure that um, you have completed everything that you needed to for this fiscal year in time. Um, you don't want to wait till after October 1st and then submit all your paperwork to us 
And then we find that what you did, the way you renewed your contract or the way you move forward is not acceptable. So if you don't complete the correct process, you would not be approved to pay that contract with CACFP funds until the required process completed and documentation has been received by um, LDOE. The sponsor would have to pay for the vended meal contract with general funds and not CACFP funds until the procurement process is approved. And one thing to remember that is if you're a sponsor and you're able to purchase those vended meals from a school food authority, which is the school system, you do not have to complete formal procurement procedures. You still have to get a quote from them and you ha have to use our vended meal contract, but you don't have to go through all those other steps that I mentioned previously. And if you do have a vended meal contract, you absolutely have to use our LDOE standard vended meal contract without any alterations. And we have a link to that right here. So I thank you for um, your time, and I will now turn this over to Jody Corbett for her to talk to you about kid care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. All right, so we're going to discuss kid care real quick. So kid care was purchased by the Division of Nutritional Support. It's a software. Um, it's web based. And there's no nothing to download. You just log into it. Um, and there's also no cost to you. So if you get um, a bill from Kid Care, that is not correct. Um, the state purchased it. So there will be no cost to you and you need to contact Kid Care. Um, and then the state agency, we just wanted to remind you that the state agency does have access to just observe. Um, when we do an inspection or something, we look into kid care just to make sure and get information before we come to the site. So kid care is mandatory. Each of you signed um, an agreement that you would uh, use kid care effective January 1st, um, but some of you are not using it and we're going to kind of go over what that means and how you can become compliant with it. Um, so in order for you to be compliant, you have to be doing the following. You have to be recording daily attendance, your meal counts uh, under the attendance, um, recording your daily menus and the amount of food you serve. Also recording all of your receipts for CACFP purchases made each month. And then electronically uploading your monthly reimbursement claim from Kid Care to the CNP website. So the Division of Nutritional Support will not make any available, um, as Karen said, you will not get your application if you are not participating in um, kid care or you have not sent back an action plan of how you plan to get onto kid care and, you, and use it actively. So you've been notified by email. If you have not received an email, then you can contact Tammy. Um, but she sent all emails out on the 9th of this month. So you might want to check your emails um, from the 9th and see if you have that email. If not, then please contact our office. Um, the complete and signed action plan must be returned to us um, by the email address, fax number, or the address listed on the email. And as of 2024, um, will be the last month that we will allow a claim to be manually uploaded into the CMP website. Um, Kid Care allows you to upload your claim and that's how it will be required after December of 2024. And this is Tammy's website uh, email address. Um, if you need to email her, if you have any questions um, about anything or if you did not receive the email. And some of you may say, well, I don't know how to do kid care. This is, we're going to walk you through how to go through trainings. Kid care is very good on, um, they have trainings for everything from beginning to end. So if you go to our website, um, CMP, and you click on the CACFP um, button, then it will walk you through. And then under resources, go under general program areas and policies. There is a tab for Kid Care training page, and it will um, send you to all of their training. Then when you pull it up, this is what you'll get. Um, it has single site, multi-site, et cetera. So if you click on the single site, if you are a single site, um, it gives you like eight different training options. The first one is how to set up your site, 
how to enroll and manage your children, how to record attendance and meal counts, how to plan and record menus, expenses, milk, claims, and reports. Kidcare does a really good job in training um, and they walk you through each and every step. And if you don't wanna to go to there, here are the direct links um, for training. And Kid Care also has office hours every Thursday, except for holidays. If you're a single site, they have training from 2.30 to 3.30. If you're a multi-site, they have training from 11.30 to 12.30. And they answer any questions that you may have, any problems that you may have. They're very good about that. So this is the settings that you must have toggled or you must have the information in. Um, in order for your claim to be uploaded correctly. So if the parent indicates that they are on SNAP, you need to have that marked as yes. Um, would you like the SNAP number validation for parents to submit the forms? It needs to say yes. So it's requiring them to put in that um, nine digit code. And then it goes through all the other center settings and everything. Um, the only one that needs to be marked no is the first one for your record daily in and out times. We do not need that. So e-forms, at this time, e-forms are not mandatory, but they can be very helpful. Um, it's a all-in-one enrollment process for the food program that eliminates paper. Um, and it also allows your participants to fill out their free and reduced meal applications. So you have to have an email address for this to work. Um, there's no way to send out an e-form if you don't have an email address. Um, and you have to be currently enrolled. It can't be someone that's new um, unless you're gonna input their information in and then send it to them and they have to set up the kid care account. So the system won't allow a parent to submit. Some benefits of using it is that the system will not allow a parent to submit an incomplete enrollment form or a free and reduced meal application. And then in, as long as you have, on the previous slide, we talked about your settings. As long as you have that toggled, it will not allow them to submit a CID or SNAP number that is not nine digit. So if the forms are complete, the system will calculate the free and reduced um, status for you, um, but you still are gonna have to review it just to make sure that information is correct. Um, if someone says they make $10,000 a week, that information is probably not correct. So you will still need to double check all the information that they provide. And you do not have to prevent any forms and store them um, in a folder they are stored in kid care and if we come out to review then we can look in kid care and see them the institution must still review the forms as i said for accuracy and electronically return the form to the parent if any corrections are required for final approval and this is just some common errors that we see um, for your en your enrollment date and your um, free and reduced meal application date should be the same. If not, then you're constantly chasing after them or you're constantly having to update the information. So if you have those two dates the same, then it makes it easier for you. Um, if you're not recording the expiration date under the participation, if the date does not match, like I said, if you have two different expiration dates, um, accepting e-forms with incorrect CID numbers, if there, it's not toggled, like I said, in the settings to say that it has to be a nine digit number, and then you're not documenting special diets or diet statements on file. Um, and then some errors with the daily menus, um, copying the actual required. So kid care will tell you what is required and you're just copying that and you're not actually putting what you served. Um, most of you, if it's required that you have three cans of peaches, you're actually serving probably four cans of peaches. So that's what you need to include, not what is required and not recording or serving a whole grain item each day. There's a little toggle that you can put 
If your bread is whole grain, you need to mark that, that it's whole grain. It will give you an error if you do not have a whole grain for each day. Or you're serving unallowable food. If you cannot find the food in kid care, then more than likely it is not allowable and you should not be serving it. Um, so if you're trying to put in veggie straws, Nutri-Grain bars, vanilla wafers, it's not going to be in kid care because kid care knows that that's not an allowable item. And then if you're serving whole milk to two-year-olds, again, that's not, we don't, that's not what you do. You serve 1% milk so that it will give you an error for that. Now your milk audit. Um, a lot of times we find that you have an incorrect carryover balance. Um because you're not checking at the beginning of the month, you're not making sure that whatever was carried over is the correct amount. And in kid care, when it carries over, it carries them over, carries it over in gallons. So if some of you are serving half pints or half gallons, then that is where your era could be coming in. Um, you just need to make sure once you start a new month, that your carryover is the right amount of what you have on site. So kid care recording, um, if you are using e-forms, then you do not need to print out your free and reduced meal applications or your enrollment forms. They are in kid care um, and we can see them if we need to come out and do an inspection. Um, your enrollment rosters are in there, your meal counts, your menus. So all of that information is electronic, but you will need to print out the following records if um, for reviews and to have on file. So if you're not using e-forms, then you need to have your meal applications and your enrollment forms printed out, your bank statements, your receipts, timesheets, training records, monitoring records, policy and procedures, and your monthly inventory. And then this is just a checklist. Um, you should have received this when we did um, a pre-approval, but it just kind of gives you um, a to-do list. Each day, you need to make sure you're marking the children in attendance, make sure you're marking the meals that are served and entering the amount of food prepared for each meal or snack. And then it'll go through weekly what you need to be doing, enter any newly enrolled children, enter menus, Enter any receipts or payments, ensure that your milk receipts are entered and calculate any claims after the last meal is served. So it's just a checklist and all this will be uploaded to FitKid um, if you have any questions about that. And then the next checklist is for multi-site sponsors. Um, again, it's the same thing. It just kind of goes over, it's a little bit more detail because you have more sites but it will be on FitKid for you to review and you should have received this when we did your pre-approval. And next I'll we'll turn it over to Brittany. Good morning. My name is Brittany Augustus and I'll be discussing the additional information and resources. So the first thing I'll discuss are the reimbursement rates. The re... Well, hold on one moment, Miss Karen. I think she wants to talk about something before I go into the reimbursement rates. I'm sorry. I just wanted to. Um, Tammy had sent a message just to remind people because she's getting some. Um, she's getting a lot of emails already. When we when we said to um, contact Tammy about kid care, it's only if. Um, you are not actively using kid care and you know it and the, and you didn't receive um, an email telling you with the action plan. You don't need, if you know you're already using kid care actively, then don't contact Tammy because she says she's gotten several uh, contacts already. It's only contact her if you know you're not actively using it, but you didn't get the action plan from her to be able to fill out and return to her. So thank you. Okay. So the reimbursement rates have been updated as of July 15th. So it's very, very important um, that you notice that for breakfast, lunch and supplements that it's a difference in price it goes about if the child is free reduced or above 
I won't just read it to you because you can kind of see it. So it just pays to make sure that your uh, parents are filling out those in, uh, enrollment forms because of the reimbursement that you receive for each category. So this is the free and reduced meal application um, that I'm talking about that you have to fill out. Make sure these applications are filled out in its entirety. That's the link that you can use to get the application. The new application was updated as of October 1st, 2024. They change every year. So at the top, it lets you know the new application will be available October 1st, 2025. So please make sure you um, fill it out in its entirety, the institution name, the facility name, the child's name. If they're a foster child, then they're automatically free. They don't have to put the information for part two, but you still need to in, um, do part three, part four, part six is you. It says for official use, you are the official. So a lot of times when we go out to the site, that part is left open because they think it's us, the state agency, but you are the official for your entity. So make sure this application is filled out in its entirety. So for example, if you have a parent that refused to give you the information for the household, that child will automatically be above. And as you can see in the previous slide, you don't get as much of a reimbursement for an above child. So please make sure that your parents are filling out this information in, in its entirety. And sometimes they don't wanna give you some stuff like for part four, at least get their signature. You know the address, you know the date, you know the phone number, you can do certain things on the app. Part three, you know that information. I know they're always in a rush, but to your best of your ability, make sure these forms are filled out in its entirety. And if a child happens to drop, you still have to keep this form for three years plus the current year, so four years. Put the drop date, put the form to the side. They might come back, then you'll just put the re-enter date if it's within the same year, you don't have to get a new form. And if they transfer to another one of your facilities, you could put the transfer date and you could take that form over and just change the name at the top if it's a different facility name. They don't have to do a new form. So just make sure you keep these forms and they are filled out in its entirety because that's the main thing that we look for when we come out because each child has to have a free and reduced meal application and it needs to be filled out completely. When we come out, you can't tell me, oh, Brittany gets uh, food stamps, I know that. I need to see that CID number. It needs to be those nine digits. It's not the food stamp card number. It's the case ID number in their cafe account. So you have to make sure the parents are filling this out because in our eyes, if it's empty, it's blank, it's above. So this is the standards that you use to fill out that application. Every July 1st, they come out with new um, income requirements. So for example, the household had a household of four people and she said that they made $1,500. You will go down to household size to number four, go over to the amount twice per month. She said she makes $1,500, she'll be free. But if that person made $1,700, you would have to go down to reduced. Four, go over twice per month, they can make $2,400, they will be reduced. But in that instance, if that person made $2,600, they're not on the list for free or reduced, so they're automatically above. So depending on what the parent put on that sheet, make sure they fill it out to let you know if that's their weekly, monthly, or yearly income. So you can use this as your guide so you're able to know what they're going to be rated as. So just say you got your applications in. This new income came out July 1st. No, you don't have to go back and do your new apps. You'll start using these new standards on any keys that you receive after July 1st. And also when you get your new application, October 1st. It's, this is also on our website as well under forms. So the compliance reviews for 2025, we're actually gonna be in region three, which is the pink area. Um, they'll be conducted mainly in region three. Let me say that appropriately because some institutions may be selected at any time for compliance review based on our new regulations from USDA. Certain institutions may require more frequent compliance monitoring to ensure program integrity. So don't think because you're not in the pink that we won't come out and do a review. As of right now, we're focusing on three. However, anybody in our state can be reviewed depending on the new regulation from USDA. The state agency now will be conducting more of the scheduled compliance reviews for this year. CNR Resource will still be conducting some of the reviews 
but mainly the state agency staff will be conducting the reviews. But CNR, if they're going to conduct your review, they'll reach out to you for documentation upload prior to the review. CNR and state agency staff will be able to access and review your information through KidCare, and records for multi-site sponsors must be kept at the location ended on your, uh, indicated on your sponsor application. So if you have multiple sites, is an area in that application that asks you where will records be kept? We're going to go to the site where the records are kept. However, that doesn't mean that's the site that we're going to stay at and do any type of monitoring of the meals. We still can go to any site that you own and do the monitoring. So don't think just because your records are at my A1 site, we won't go to your B site. So you make sure you're doing everything you're supposed to do at your sites because you don't know what site will go out and do our physical meal monitor. So we're doing something different. It's an annual financial review of sponsoring organizations. Some sites have already been receiving emails. So in accordance with the USDA Spinal Integrity Rule published in August of 2023, the state must annually review at least one month of a sponsoring organization's bank account activity against other associated records to verify that the financial transactions meet program requirements. This provision does not apply to our independent centers or school food authorities. So if you are a sponsoring organization, you will receive an email from a CACFP staff requesting that the following document documentation is provided to us for a designated test month. You have to submit the completed bank statement, copies of any process checks that's listed on their bank statement, copies of all receipts for purchases listed on their bank statement, an explanation for any transferred funds seen on the bank statement, failure to submit those financial records as requested may result in additional state agency action. If an unallowable cost is identified, the state agency could let you know, hey, depending on the severity of it, it might prompt you to have a review. It might make us come out and do a technical assistance. It's just, it's going to depend. We might say, hey, you know what? Give us the whole year of bank statements and receipts. We need to see what's going on. So just make sure when someone reach out to you, go ahead and send them everything that's needed because we are required now, if you have more than one site, to request every year your financial records. So this is the document checklist of what we check for when we come out and do a review. Jody kind of touched bases on a lot of this stuff, so I'm not going to get into full detail. And this list as well is on the website or on FitKid. But this is the checklist that we use when we come out and do a review. Typically, when someone comes out to do a review, we'll contact you. And sometimes it will be unannounced. And we'll give you a list of items so you can go ahead and know the test month and be prepared to have the things checked. So we're going to check your free and reduced meal apps, either paper or on a kid care. We're going to look at the roster to make sure everyone that you claim for that test month has an application, your permit agreement. Your meal count records, meaning your um, for that particular month, we're going to check to see if those kids were in attendance for the claim that you completed. We're going to do your daily attendance records. A lot of times we do check that in care care. That's why care care is very, very important because it allows us to check the stuff prior to coming out, out so we're not at your site all day. We can look at the main things in kid care to see, and then we come out and look at the items that we're not able to see in person. Um, we check those menu worksheets. We check to see if the items that you're uh, serving are allowable items. Um, we check your special diets to make sure you're providing the kids with the items that they're able to eat. Um, we check your training and monitoring. So you tell us when you're going to conduct your training and monitoring. So just be very mindful of the months that you say you're going to conduct training and monitoring. Write it on your calendar so you can know, hey, I said in October I'm going to do my uh buying guide. Make sure you mark everything down so you'll have it because we allow you to pick the months that you want to do your training. Keep up with your financial records, your bank statements, your cancel checks, your deposits, um, all your receipts, your labor expenses. Just make sure you have that up in some type of folder or some type of binder because those are the main things that we look at, look at on site because we don't have access to that in key care. Copy of all milk receipts for the test month. Um, your procurement records, your labor, the policies and procedures. We give you the list of policies and procedures. Those probably never will change unless you change your handbook. Take a binder, 
put that in that binder so we can say, hey, let us see your policies and procedures. You could just hand us your staff handbook. Make sure that non-discrimination policy is in your parent handbook as well as your employee handbook. But the critical program functions, we give you that. If you don't have that, let us know. It's on the website. Make sure you have that listed. Licensing. We just check to make sure you're supposed to be operating. We check that on your licensing board and those are the main things when we come out and do a review, what we look for. Kid Care has helped a lot because we're able to look in the system prior to coming, put a little notes down, and then when we come to your site, is a little faster because we already know what we didn't see in Kid Care or what we saw in Kid Care. And nine times out of 10, we have everything we need before we come out. So these are some common errors in the compliance monitoring that we have noticed in the last couple of months when we've been doing our doing monitoring. So for the enrollment attendance, not having a free reduced meal application or an annual enrollment form on file for each participant enrolled at the facility. When a child comes to your site, either it's a Head Start or a center, they need to have a free and reduced price meal application if you plan on claiming that child. They have to have an application. Also, we noticed that the incorrect categorization of the free reduce. So when I say incorrect, for instance, the child, you know, Brittany gets food stamps. So automatically in your mind, she's free. You have them incorrectly categorized because you're putting she's free, but you don't have the information to back up why she's free. Or you're not lose, using that list to show how you came up with the categorization of her being free. So just make sure that you use that July 1st list to tell you these are the income requirements to make sure that all of your kids are categorized correctly. And also in properly maintaining the meal count attendance records. What we mean by that, you if you're using kid care, you're going in, checking a child as being present, breakfast, lunch, and snack. When we were doing it by paper, people were not documenting the meal count attendance to know that those kids are getting breakfast, lunch, and snack. Also, we noticed too, whenever uh, we go out and do visits, you have to make sure that you're marking those children getting the meals at the time they're getting the meals. You have to have some documentation that ch that child is getting breakfast. When we come out, just say we're monitoring your breakfast. I need to see you marking Brittany receiving a plate. I need you marking Karen's getting a plate. You can't just have in your mind that Brittany and Karen got breakfast and then go back days later and say, well, I know Brittany was there. She got breakfast. Because what if I came to school late that day and I didn't receive breakfast? You just can't go by the attendance for the day. You need to be marking at the time of them receiving that meal that they received it. Use your iPad, use a sheet of paper, however it makes it uh, easy for you. But they have to be marked getting the meal at, uh, the meal at the time they're receiving that meal. Also, we've noticed those menus and menu worksheets are improperly maintained daily. You have to make sure you're putting in the morning, in the morning time, you go wait to the evening. When you fix the food, make sure you're putting the right amount. Don't just put what kid care is telling you that you're supposed to have. Because I'm sure if it's telling you you need to have one pound of grit, grits, you're giving probably two and you're cooking two and three pounds of grits. If it's telling you you need to have 20 morsels of rice. I know you're not serving 20 morsels of rice. So just be very mindful that you're keeping up with your daily menu worksheets and also serving the wrong milk or not enough milk. We have tend to see that people are giving all of their kids whole milk. Whole milk is for your infants to one. Once they make two, they should be receiving that 1% milk. They should not be receiving whole milk. You have It tells you on that milk audit if you look at that milk audit, it's telling you how much milk you should have served for that day. If you're starting to notice a trend that you're always short, you're not ordering enough milk. You need to make sure you're purchasing enough milk to give to those children. Financials. Another thing we noticed that people are buying a lot of unallowable items with the CACFP funds. You cannot go to the store, your cook cannot go to the store and buy them a chicken sandwich or buy them a soda or buy them a bag of chips on your food account. You cannot do that. It has to be allowable items. A lot of times we tend to tell you, hey, just put the money back, but it's starting to be too consistent that we're noticing that people are buying items that's not approved out of their food account. You have to follow your approved budget. We're noticing too that people don't realize that they can put non-food items as far as paper plates, dishwashing detergent. Go ahead and indicate that in your budget, you are allowed to do it, but you have to tell us that's what you wanna do. 
Also, a lot of missing receipts for the purchases. People tend to get the flip and trying to figure out where's this receipt, where's that receipt, because we take your bank statement up against those receipts. We check the receipts to make sure that they are allowable items. However, we check your bank statement to see if that's the receipt that's on that bank statement. So if someone is going to the store for you or if you're going at night, put the receipt in an envelope. Put it in a folder because those receipts are very, very important. Just because it was received from Walmart doesn't mean you bought food items. So you can't tell me, well, I went to Walmart, you see it on my bank statement, but I don't see the receipt. So a lot of times, if it's a lot of money, we're going to make you pay it back. Also, another issue we're noticing is access funds in the account. You cannot have more than three months of reimbursement in your account accumulated because at that point, we're trying to figure out, do you even need our money? Do you need the food money? because you have too much money in your account. So what we're saying is use your money for what you need to use your money for. Don't just hold on to it for a rainy day. We are a reimbursement, but use your money in your account to make sure your children are eating and buying the supplies that you need at your site. Now, sometimes we might come to your site and your two or three reimbursements have been just posted, then we understand that. But if we're looking and see that it's a common error that there's too much money just sitting in a food account trainings and monitorings. Please record your documented trainings and monitorings and make sure they are complete. Again, you are telling us when you want to complete your trainings and monitoring. So please go ahead and write it on your calendar. When you do your applications next week, look at your calendar for the year. Say, hey, my staff will be here this day because everyone has to complete their training. And then the monitoring is you monitoring your, your kitchen. So go ahead and set down and work you a calendar and indicate what days you want to do your trainings and what days you want to do your monitoring because you're allowed to pick it. So we expect you to have it because when we come out, we are checking it. So this is our staff listing. As Karen said at the beginning, we have a, a lot of new people on board. Um, David Thibodeau, he used to be in the position that we're currently in. He's now our program director. I am Brittany Augustus. I'm a person that will come out in the field. You will see me. Miss Jody was on the phone earlier, the call earlier. She's a program consultant. Debbie Gary, Sherelle Morgan, Alicia Murphy, Murphy, Anthony Perino, Karen Price, and Karen, Karen Snight. All of us are EPC2s, meaning that we're the ones that you may see in the field coming to do a TA, coming to do a pre-approval, or coming to do a review. You can call us at any time. This is our contact information. This is our email information. Ms. Tammy Boyd and Ms. Michelle Bueller, they're the ones that you probably talk on the phone to the most because they're our admin people that are in the building. However, anybody on this list, you're able to reach out to us. We're always available. We Sometimes we're, we are in the field, but if you shoot us a quick email, leave us a message, we will contact you back. And now, oh, miscellaneous, one more thing, congregate meal service. All CACFP meals and snacks must be consumed on site. They cannot be sent home with the participants to be eaten at home. So if little Johnny has a doctor's appointment, he's about to walk out the door and you're just serving lunch, just serving snack. If mom's in a hurry, I'm sorry, Johnny cannot get that meal out the door. He has to sit down and eat it or he cannot receive it. You cannot hand the snacks out. You cannot hand the food out as they're walking on the door. They have to sit on site and consume the meal. Let mom know, I know he loves chicken nuggets. I know he loves these little uh, piece of rolls that we do, but he has to eat it on site. He can't sneak it off the site because if anything's happened to him, you know, you're liable. You have to eat it on site. And I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Debbie Gary. She'll talk about the uh, upcoming trainings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brittany. Good morning, everyone. It's Debbie. Um, we do have some upcoming trainings that I want to tell you guys about. Um, on, in September, September 25th, we're going to be um, having our monthly training on, and we're going to be discussing um, processing and using cook, admin, and labor and using the timesheets and transferring the money um, in order to repay the cooks, some cook salary and admin salary. In October, we're going to be doing discussing kid care tips and um, beginning the new fiscal year. In November, we're going to be going over entering receipts and inventory. Um, so I hope you're looking forward to those upcoming trainings. Um, so for today, today's meeting is being recorded. 
just like usual, um, we're going to post this recording to the Louisiana Fit Kids website. You will have 24-7 access to this recording. If you want to watch this recording at 2 a.m., please do. Um, and we're going to have all the handouts that we discussed today. They're going to be posted on this website as well. You will be getting an email um, with the um, website link to go on and watch this training. You can download these PowerPoints, print them out. Um, you will have full access to this training um, for however long you want it. It will be on the Fit Kids website. Also, real quick today, if you're um, when you um, anyone logged into this um, training today, you're going to receive an email from me um, by Friday, um, and it, this email will serve as your clock hours documentation for Louisiana Pathways. Um, so you will get credit um, for the for however long the time that you are on this training for today in one hour increments, okay? Um, if you registered separately for each email address. So um, please don't get worried. Um, I know we're going over a lot of information today. It is wonderful information and we thoroughly appreciate, we have about 200 of you on today. Um, we very much appreciate you taking time out of your busy day because we know you guys are busy. Um, we very much appreciate you taking the time to attend this training today. So we're going to make all of this available to you. Um, I'm going to begin with the uh, civil rights and child nutrition programs. This is the last part of training today. I anticipate that this will take about 45 minutes. So if you have an additional 45 minutes to give to us today, um, this is a required training. I would love for you to, to, um, to do that. Our non-discrimination statement, we will um, we begin with that. So the purpose of civil rights training is to inform, educate, and support all staff who interact with child nutrition program applicants. Okay, you, uh, This is to inform the staff of their rights and, ability and responsibilities as administrators of a child nutrition program to ensure equal treatment for all applicants and beneficiaries, to educate on general USDA civil rights requirements and eliminate any potential legal barriers um, that could prevent or deter people from receiving these benefits, to promote dignity and respect for all, and to provide resources and information to assist your staff in carrying out their civil rights responsibilities. So what is discrimination? This is defined as treatment which makes a distinction of any one person or group, either intentionally or unintentionally, by neglect or actions based on protected classes. And these protected classes are race, color, national origin, sex, age, and disability. All staff must be trained annually on civil rights. And it doesn't matter whether the staff is part-time, temporary, volunteers, or full-time. All of your staff has to be trained on civil rights. And you have to document the training on our signing sheets. Okay, and it lists the agenda, the date, and the time of training. So this is what this training is going to go over today. It's going to go over the collection and use of data, effective public notification systems, the compliant procedures, um, compliance review techniques, resolution techniques for non-compliance, requirements for accommodation of persons with disabilities, requirements for language assistance, Conflict resolution and customer service. Public notification, what is the purpose? Okay, you have to inform um, the public that your agency participates in the child nutrition program. Okay, and once a year, the state sends out a list, so we do that on your behalf um, to meet that requirement. And we all, it, it, it's also to reach as many applicants, participants, or potentially eligible persons as possible. Uh, these notifications must convey a message of equal opportunity in all photos and graphics that are used to promote and provide program-related information. 
and public notifications must be available in alternative formats for persons with disabilities um, and in appropriate languages for limited English proficient persons. So this public notification includes information on eligibility, the benefits and services, program um, availability, applicants' rights and responsibilities, procedures for filing a complaint, non-discrimination policies, and any program changes. So methods of public notification. So uh, like a public release, um, inform that, that informs the general public that your agency does participate in this federally funded program. You prominently display the most current and justice for all poster. And you, in on any method of communication that you send out, um, we know a lot of days, um, a lot of times these days, you guys have your own Facebook pages for your businesses, for your centers. Um, so anything on the internet, newspaper articles, can be radio or TV, letters, can be news letters or bulletins. Um, all of this has to have um, a non-discrimination statement, okay? Now, we know the non-discrimination statement is big. So there is a condensed version of this non-discrimination statement, and it's in the middle of the screen. It says, this institution is an equal opportunity provider. So um, on your Facebook pages or any type of um, um, notifications that you do, that statement um, needs to be on those notifications. This is our Injustice for All poster, okay? Um, you need to have those in each for each of your participating facilities. Um, it's got to be in a highly visible location, visible to both staff and public. It's got to be the 11 by 17 in size. Um, so make sure that you have that. If not, we can provide those to you or you can order them um, from USDA. Okay. Um, it's included on, again, all forms of communication um, for the public or anything that mentions USDA programs. The long version, you're going to use that whenever possible. So this long version is what is going to be printed in your employee handbook and your parent handbook. Okay? And you're going to use this version word for word. You're not going to change. You're going to copy and paste it. You're not going to change one letter of the alphabet on that. It is going to be direct word for word. The short version, okay, this institution is an equal opportunity provider. Um, you're going to use that if, if your material is too small to permit the full statement, okay? It has to be at least nine point font, okay? So if you're going to do put um, print up menus uh, for the public, then that statement has to be on the menus. Here's the long version, okay? The most updated one is from um, May of 2020, 2022. This is, again, on our website, um, and you will have access to this um, on Louisiana Thinkers. So, printing requirements. Wording for either statement, again, must be exact. It cannot be changed in any way. The print size for either statement can't be any smaller than that in the text of the material. So if you're using a 12 font for your material, then this, these statements have to be, again, in a 12, in at least a 12 font. So again, the shorter version may be used um, if the full version cannot fit. And vital documents about sensitive topics, okay, require the full non-discrimination statement regardless, regardless if it is only one page. So the non-discrimination statement has to be, these are all examples of materials, okay? I'm not going to go over this word for word, but um, we visited on, you know, we've already stated most of these. It has to be um, on any um, promotional material that you um, put out, even if it's, um, if you're doing a radio ad, Okay. So at the end of the radio ad, um, whenever you're speaking, you need to say this institution is an equal opportunity for life uh, because it does need to be in all forms. 
meal service and customer service. All enrolled participants uh, must be allowed equal opportunities to participate in the child nutrition programs, regardless of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability, okay? All participants must be treated equally. Seating arrangements, serving lines, um, assignment of eating periods, or methods of selection for um, application approval and verification processes, um, none of this can be, um, none of this can be considered when determining um, all of these items. All applicants must be treated equally. Separation by gender, use USDA memo SP31-2015. Um, we have a link at the bottom and that provides more information on separation by gender. So what about denial of meals? USDA policy prohibits the denial of meals as a disciplinary action against any participant who is enrolled in a facility that participates in the child nutrition program. This includes any type of disciplinary action that results um, in the loss or denial of meals. And this is, it also um, um, uh, prevents requiring a child to work for their meal. Over identification, okay? Um, identifying information must not be used for any purpose other than determining and verifying eligibility for free or reduced meals. Okay, and overt identification of any child is prohibited. And no overt identification may be used when ordering meals for special functions. What this means is, is if you do something, when you do something overt, okay, it is not secret, it is not hidden, and it is out in the open, okay? So your teachers and the and the staff members um, that are working for you in your facilities um, do not need to know whether a child is free, reduced, or above. Okay, that information is all, should only be allowed um, and should only be known by the person who has direct who has direct responsibilities for determining that information. Okay, um, and only that information can be used for that purpose. That's what an overt identification means. Means you have to do your part. That has to be kept. That has that is protected information, and that can't be used to determine um, any other um, special meals or any other identification of children. Um, LEP language assistance responsibility to take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to programs and activities by persons with limited English proficiency. If you have any individuals um, or potential customers of your business, of your centers, who do not speak English as their primary language and have the limited um, ability to read, speak, or write the English language because of their national origin, um, if you fail to provide reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to their programs, this could be considered discrimination on the basis of national origin, okay? So what is meaningful access? That is provided through reasonable, timely, appropriate, and competent language services to individuals with limited English proficiency when, ac when accessing programs and services. language translations. So to provide someone meaningful access, you um, can do the following things. Um, you can make your information available to participants and families in the necessary language, okay? Your enrollment forms on the USDA site, those could be printed up. Um, and provided in, in, in any number of different languages. Your menus, in, any of informational brochures or letters to families, those can all be converted um, in your, in like Microsoft Word. 
those can all be converted to different languages, okay? So in order to provide meaningful access, you consider the number and proportion of LAP individuals um, eligible to be served are likely to be encountered by the program, okay? You guys know your areas. You know if you have um, a high population of individuals that, that do not um, use the English language, okay? Then you would know that you would have to um, provide your documentation and provide your services in a different language, okay? You would consider the frequency of which those individuals come in contact with your program. You're going to consider the nature and importance of the program and activity and service and the resources available to the recipient. So language interpreters. Children should not be used as interpreters. Applicants and participants um, cannot be asked to bring their own interpreters. Um, that's up to you as, as, as the owner of the business. And volunteers may be used, okay? Um, and, but they should understand the ethics for being an interpreter. Like for example, um, if you have a Spanish, te Spanish teacher, could assist a household in completing the applications, but that teacher would need to be trained on the importance of keeping all that information confidential. Um, for more information on limited English proficient, go to www.lep.gov, and there is a lot more information and a lot more resources available to you to assist you. Racial and ethnic data, okay? Um, uh, Ms. Karen uh, um, has touched on this in, in part of her program this morning. So we're going to review this really quickly. That racial and ethnic data is used to determine how effectively your program is reaching potential eligible children and where outreach may be needed. So this data is collected annually. Um, it's usually collected at the time of enrollment. We know it's on the free and reduced price meal applications. We know it's voluntary um, that they self-identify or self-report this data. We know that we only use this for statistical purposes and it has no bearing on eligibility criteria. Um, children are not asked um, or surveyed if the data is not provided. And you cannot use visual identification um, to collect the data and keep those current, keep those records for um, three years plus the current year. So here are our categories. So the ethnic categories are Hispanic or Latino, and then non-Hispanic or non Latino. And the following are the race categories. Persons with disabilities, what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to provide accessible facilities, okay? And this includes parking lots, entrances and exits, halls, elevators, and restrooms. Provide appropriate information in alternative formats. That could be Braille um, materials, that could be any, um, any other type of English or, or language, that could be sign language or interpreters. You're gonna, your responsibility to provide food substitution for participants with disabilities, allergies, or cultural or religious preferences when documented. Um, please note that no additional costs can be charged to the household um, to meet that responsibility. And an individual with a disability should be accommodated in the least restrictive and most integrated setting as possible. Meal modifications. A disability is, def is defined as a person who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities, okay? Um, has a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. Major life activities, this could mean um, performing self-care, performing manual tasks such as walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning or working, okay? Disabilities involving major bodily functions are also included. So modifications within the meal pattern do not require a medical statement. 
modifications outside the meal pattern do require a medical statement. Let me touch on this a little bit. So if the modification is that um, they don't eat beef feet, but they can have chicken, okay? Those are both meats. Those are, that is within the meal pattern component. They're both, they're both considered meats. Um, so it doesn't require a medical statement for disability. Now, it does require some type of written statement for, um, for preference or um, something else from the parent, okay, that, that you can have them write that statement. But this is specifically discussed in the medical statement. So modifications outside of the meal pattern, those do require that, okay? So, and this is what we are currently all doing. Let's use the example from milk. If, um, if a child or a participant can, is allergic, they have a medical disability, which requires them, um, they cannot have cow's milk, okay? We get medical statements for that. And on the statement, it states what they can have. Okay, a nutritionally equivalent product to cow's milk. Okay, if the statement does not fully explain the modification needed, the sponsor needs to contact you know, you contact the guardian for additional information. Okay, but receipt of the clarification should not delay the sponsor from providing the modification. If you have questions, still provide that modification, but again, get the clarification that you need. Right to file a complaint. Any person who believes that they or someone that they know has been discriminated against based on federal protected classes has the right to file a complaint within 180 days of the alleged discriminatory action. Um, and this is the address, this is how to do so. This is the civil rights complaint form. All staff must be trained on this form. Um, and the compliant form must be of this form has got to be available at all sites. Um, and the staff should allow the individuals to file their own complaint with as little involvement as possible. So the non-discrimination statement and this and this complaint form should be in your again in your parent handbook and in your employee handbook. So form. Forms of civil rights complaint, these, these can be written, verbal, or anonymous, okay? If you're receiving a complaint verbally, please just listen politely. These complaints can be made over the phone. They can be made, by, uh, you know, in a letter, email, fax, or any other form of communication. Anonymous complaints should be handled just like any other complaint. Um, and these complaints can be related to any area. Um, of the child nutrition program operation. It can be program administration, it can be food service, it can be employment, seating arrangements, it can be inside or outside of the facility. Um, you could, you know, those are forms of the complaints that you could potentially receive. So step one, you're gonna to wanna to document the complaint, okay? If they're telling you about that, um, you're gonna want um, to be as specific as possible with the name and location of the, of the entity delivering the service or benefit, the nature of the incident. Okay, you're going to want to know what happens, um, the method of administration that led to the complainant to feel discriminated against. You're going to want to know the basis on which the complainant feels discriminated. Is it race? Is it color? Is it national origin, sex, age, or disability? You're going to want to know the names, the titles, the business addresses, and phone numbers of any person who may have had knowledge of this discriminatory action. And you're going to want to know the date or dates um, of during which the alleged actions occurred or the duration of the such action. Step number two, contact state agency and USDA. Okay. Um, all verbal or written complaints must be forwarded to USDA and the state agency within three days of receiving a complaint. Maintain records, okay? Have a central location and where copies of civil rights um, complaints will be documented and kept, okay? And um, 
you can you can provide a complaint form to any individual wishing to make a complaint or any person um, or, or if you're receiving any verbal or phone complaint. Here is the link to our website and the forms where you will find um, the civil rights complaint forms. Conflict resolution. Um, a lot of times skills, good customer service and communication skills can avoid a potential civil rights complaint. Um, so one thing, five goals that you should have. Avoid the desire to blame. Okay, when you're taking a complaint, um, avoid the desire to place blame on any anything or anyone. Try to improve the situation. Um, communicate your feelings directly. Okay, be open and honest. Improve relationships and increase communication um, with the complainant. And avoid repeating the situation. Here's a few civil rights reminders. Um, the USDA Regional Office is responsible for the review of state agencies. So just like how we guys come out to your centers and we conduct reviews, USDA is with us um, very, very frequently. They come to our offices here in Baton Rouge and they review us, okay? So in, in the process of reviewing us, they're also reviewing how we handle and how we administer um, the child nutrition program to you. So a state agency is responsible for reviewing uh, sponsors and providers and subrecipients of this federal money. So we must report any significant findings to USDA. Um, sponsors must receive a pre-approval visit to ensure compliance with civil rights before receiving federal funds. Compliance is assessed through the administrative review. So USDA comes to us and they will conduct a full administrative review on everything that we do, including of our policies and procedures and how we handle um, everything that we do with you guys. And access to compliant information shall be limited and controlled to assure confidentiality. So resolution of non-compliance, if non-compliance is indicated, a correction action plan um, must be implemented to achieve voluntary compliance within 60 days. If you have um, a complaint, a corrective action plan, which would describe your agency's actions taken to resolve the non-compliance with civil rights, um, and suspension of assistance or termination of benefits could result if non-compliance is not resolved with a civil rights complaint. Here's a checklist. Um, civil rights, written policies, and a compliant law should be kept. Train all staff and volunteers annually. Okay. On the applications, on the sponsor application that you're going to be getting next week from us, it states you pick your two dates. Okay. And the first date, generally, we like to see that within October or November, or the first two months of the beginning of the program. So, and the first one is, manda is mandated for um, civil rights and record keeping, okay? So, you can use this presentation and um, to train your staff on civil rights. The, the dates that you guys pick, if you pick October and March, please do them in October and March to avoid a technical assistance finding on a review. So, again, train all your staff and volunteers. Um, all staff should know the civil rights um, policy. Prominently display those posters, those addresses for all posters. Collect and record your racial and ethnic data. Okay. Keep all records for three years plus current. Maintain civil rights compliant procedures and forms. And place non discrimination statement on all printed, mirror, printed uh, materials mentioning child nutrition programs. Okay. Um, policies regarding civil rights complaints and um, should specify how compliance is handled um, for child nutrition programs separate from other programs. Here is a list of resources. Um, this is updated. This is 
probably with all the resources that you'll ever need um, in order to gain more information and find more support um, for your civil rights programs in your individual centers. And again, you will be receiving this um, um, information where to find this on Fit Kids, and you will be able to um, download this presentation and rewatch it at your convenience. Whoops. Again, here are other resources. Okay, these are state specific resources. This is the CMP um, website link. Kid Care, USDA, My Play. These are wonderful resources. Um, when you have time to click on these links, um, and they really provide you with a wealth of information um, about the child nutrition program, and they can really make things a lot easier for you. Okay, this brings us to the end of our training today. Thank you all for being with us. Um, 